Welcome to the Winning with Shopify podcast. This is the podcast to help you scale your Shopify store into a money-making machine. The Winning with Shopify podcast is powered by Spec, who is the sponsor for this series. Get ready to take notes. Now, over to the studio. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Winning Shopify podcast. Today, I'm super excited to have a very special guest with me I'm going to introduce in a second. This is our last episode on social. So if you're tuning in going, this is the first time I've ever listened to Winning with Shopify. You've got three weeks of amazing content on social to, to, to roll back and, and go and listen to. Plus, prior to that, we've, also, we've been running this podcast about five or six years now. So there's a huge amount of content there. So go and check out other stuff. Hit subscribe. Leave us a review all the above. I say it every time. If you've been tuning in for a while, welcome back. Um, absolute pleasure to have you with us today. Um, and I'm very excited to, uh, to introduce my very special guest I'm going to come on to you now. Um, his name's Dom, and he founded a company called Social Chain, which we're going to talk about a little bit. And he's now working with a business that he has also founded. It's called Fearless Adventures. And I'm going to let Dom explain a little bit more in a second. But Dom, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so yeah, as you mentioned, founded Social Chain. Mm. Um, you know, we were probably the first social media agency to really scale in the UK and globally. Um, that was almost, almost, yeah, over, uh, almost 10 years ago. God, it feels like I'm a, nice. I'm aging, but I'm, I'm, I'm in my thirties yeah. now. I'm in my thirties now. And I always said, I don't want to be running a social media company when I'm 30. So <laughs> thankfully that didn't come true. Um, and as you mentioned there, since, since then gone on to launch first and first adventures, which uh, is a VC business. So we invest and in support scaling, uh, early stage companies. Um, predominantly in the consumer space. So um, basically taking what I learned from working with multinational clients um, and the kind of some of the techniques there, but mm. applying it to um, some really great, exciting early stage companies, which as I said before, I'll basically use Shopify. Nice, nice. And we've already, just before we hit record, everybody, is a little spoiler alert. We've been talking about some slightly controversial things relating to social media that we will come on to um, in a set. Yeah, Dom, pleasure to have you with us today and appreciate your intro. Um, I, let's let's start right with the basics then. So let's talk uh, probably more on your more recent experience about Fearless then. A lot of our clients will be sitting there listening to this. A lot of our listeners, um, sorry, not just clients, but a lot of our listeners will be sitting there listening to this and going, right, you sound like an expert, Dom. You've done it with the big corporates. You've seen how things can scale globally. Um, I've got 10 followers on Facebook or I've never really done anything on social. We've got some orders coming from the site now, but never really started stuff on social. What are before we come into like the strategy and where to start, what are some of the challenges they're facing today that they wouldn't have faced sort of five, 10, 20 years ago? Yeah, I think, I think coming back to exactly your point there, what you said about social chain work with big clients, those were mm. the ones who had defined marketing budgets that had budgets to put into what, you know, you'd call brand activation. And that was very, you know, one of the things we kind of uh, emphasized at social chain was that you know, social is a, plan, is a brand platform. You know, it's the ability to engage with customers for the first time. When Facebook was introduced, it's actually the first time an FMCG brand could speak to their customers, collect data on their customers. So actually the use of it was um, for brand. And, you know, we can get into a big debate around what is brand and what is marketing. And those two things are very, very different mm. for me. And I always like yep. the analogy around um, dating. I don't know why, but, um, you know, brand, brand is what um, opens the door and marketing is the, the conversion funnel. So... Um, mm. You know, there's a very, there's a very um, where social sits in kind of the the structure of marketing at the moment is is is, is always is for me is always top of funnel um, from a brand perspective. And then when you look at kind of the performance channels that come off the back of that, you know, with Meta and what they do from a performance aspect, there's a lot of question marks over where should we emphasise and put our focus and put our budget in. Um, and I think maybe again with the investment hat on, uh, maybe four or five years ago. The first thing brands are asking, you know, investors are asking is, you know, what is your social media following? Are you guys yeah. cool? Are you guys cool? And are you relevant? And do you understand that? And I think since then, um, the emphasis has shifted more from uh, brand perception and social media to actually hard numbers. You know, what is revenue? What is profit? Um, yeah, yeah. And that doesn't always coincide very well with social media following because uh, you could have a great following, and we've seen this in the influence marketing space. You could have a hugely engaged follower following. But you actually, your ability to convert to customers from that following mm. is very poor. Uh, and we saw that through working with hundreds of thousands of influencers across many years. Yeah, yeah. I did, really good answer. And I, yeah, I, I said we're going to get deep on this very quickly. We're four minutes in and we're already talking about the history of social. Um, you've touched on a few things there, right? Attribution. And you've mentioned that like, it's top of funnel. Which means you could, as you say, you could have this massive following, but actually it's not converting to customers or you can't prove that you're doing that. There's no 
AI automation through messaging, like we heard from Beast Gear a few months ago, um, and they're doing some really smart sort of tactical stuff in that. I think that there's a real danger, isn't there, with with as you say, with social, that someone can actually go and buy a ton of followers and then pretend they're bigger than they are. Then you start looking at the engagement per post and going, well, there's not much engagement, and then you start looking at revenue that's coming at the bottom, and there's not much revenue either. As from an from a uh, you know from an acquisition point of view, if someone's looking to acquire a Shopify business or an e-commerce store at the moment, how relevant are those stats? What are the things you're really looking for, or what does the brand need to prove to then be sold? Yeah, hundred percent. I think it's it's definitely that omni-channel approach. You know, anyone who's got one, a single channel of acquisition is proven they can master one, but they've proven they can't scale across other channels. So yeah. you know, a, a really healthy channel split um, where you know no channel is making up. Tw- over 25% of the business. Obviously, you've got huge um, businesses which have great trade relationships, which have you know B2B relationships, which have you know utilize Amazon as well. But if you are, um, what I think, what I think I'm, we're seeing now, and this is this is um, probably the story for most of the investments we've seen and, and the investments we're looking at, is that they've managed to grow really well to a threshold of, of, from one channel. You know, they've managed yeah. to master one channel very very well. And what you get in that situation is you you get a lot of founders who are experts on that one channel but don't know how to go across multi-channel. So when we're looking at investment, when we're looking at investment stage, it's like, have these guys proven the products got legs? Mm. And that can come from one channel, that can come from social, that can come from PPC, it can come from anywhere. So it, have they proven that people are interested in buying it? Yes. From an exit perspective and selling the business, it's much more integrated. You know, have these guys mastered manufacturing? Have they managed to insult manufacturing? Or if not, why not? Why not? Have they managed to prove this is interested in across multiple channels where they can buy, sell across different areas, but also internationalization? Yeah. Have they managed to prove that this business, this business is interested in, in international aspects? So um, we like I like to look at businesses which have maybe got um, one channel hmm. perfected and they've, they've proven it. That's when I want to make an investment. I want to make an investment in a business which has got to a million pound revenue from one channel. And then I want to support them hmm. taking that business omni-channel to a point of exit where you know that revenue figure is multiplied 20x the business is much more mature um and they've proven that you know that those areas the business is actually transferable across different international segments as well yeah yeah absolutely and there's, there's another danger with that single channel as well isn't there like if we mentioned earlier as well when we were chatting pre-recording like when facebook suddenly said you can only hit five percent or something of your audience now when you post organically like you've got to pay to do that and i sort of said that was the death of social and your response again this is one of the controversial things we we're talking about your response which i think is really interesting as well is you said actually there was just a gold rush on paid then yep. so then all well, click costs are going to go up aren't they because it works in an auction but there is that danger if you're just reliant on facebook when that happens pre the whole meta everything else but if you're just reliant on facebook and that suddenly happens or um what was it two years ago now june two years ago the ios, iOS updates yeah. happened yeah, so it's so dangerous. But it's interesting how you're now coming in going, actually, if they've mastered a channel and not the others, that's exciting from you guys, not just going, we're going to buy it, we're going to invest in it, scale it up, and then we'll see what's next. Yeah, and I think that's, that's you know, we've seen a lot of founders and we see a lot of what's interesting from the agency space is now, you know, you've got a specialist agencies by channel basis. You know, you've got mm. email only agencies, you've got Amazon only agencies. So um, what you see now is that the, the kind of specialisms across channels have become so much deeper. You know, when yeah. that, that Facebook goal rush happened, utilizing Facebook paid was very simple. You know, it, the, you know, this is also before a lot of GDPR and a lot of kind of data, data kind of restrictions that the platforms mm. faced. You know, there was really easy targeting tools to convert sales. But also to your point there, it wasn't as busy, you know, the big, the big brands hadn't rushed on to Facebook from performance aspects. So, you were seeing yep. in very early stage young businesses being able to utilize Facebook and social to sell to younger customers um, before the kind of bidding algorithm started to build up. So um, that that doesn't exist now in in um, on, on, on Facebook. You know, it, it's now a media channel which all all brands are paying that they're effectively their their tax to because they have to they, you know they have to be there. Um, yeah. That that opportunity does still, still exist in new areas. So when platforms introduce new um, products or features so i guess you know reels is a big one obviously tiktok as a new mm. platform is a new platform is a big one yeah, yeah. is that there's opportunities to win on those platforms so entrepreneurs and founders which go to these new platforms first learn how to utilize them activate mm. paid early on will have success um you know we're, we're now in a landscape where twitter's rebranding we're in a landscape where threads is being released we're in a landscape where tiktok did, tiktok is probably where facebook was five years ago in terms of being so busy so that opportunity to create something out of nothing uh, 
always diminishes by the time the length of platform has been there. So, you know, when we were in TikTok in COVID, every single person felt like they were going viral. That isn't there anymore um, because, the, the, you know, they're starting mm. to be a, a paid for platform. It was all free then. So, you know, we have to look at what is new. We have to look at what areas are coming out for people to be able to benefit from social. And um, the, like I say, the opportunities will exist and they will come around. But um, what we've got now is, you know, if, if, even if you include YouTube into the, social, into the social area, which, you know, a lot of people mm. do, these are legacy channels now. These are 10, 10, 10, 15 year old channels that have been around for a very long time. You know, they are highly profitable for the businesses that own them. Um, mm. So therefore they have to be able to make sure they're valuable. And when you've got, you know, let's look at Barbie and Oppenheimer, you know, these two big releases, which are putting their, yeah. me their media spend across every single Facebook um, or YouTube pre-roll. Small businesses are actually competing with big boys now in these areas and to win, it's becoming much more difficult. That's why you're seeing, I guess, more creative businesses going after sponsoring podcasts. That's why you're seeing emphasis on maybe more organic content um, because the pay channels are becoming much more occupied yeah. by large media budgets. Absolutely. It's such an interesting, interesting um, perspective you've got as well. I haven't been, I mean, you say you're in your early 30s, so am I. Um, yeah, and I, I certainly didn't realize I was still going to be playing on Google in my early 30s, but here I am um, and it's evolving. But it's interesting to actually to hear your perspective across those different channels. I was going to ask, you know, what are some of the channels people should target? And I know the answer is always going to start with it depends. It depends what business you are and what's going on. But I think it's interesting how you've said actually the big corporates were shying away from Facebook when perhaps a lot of the small businesses probably thought they were currently cleaning up which is not not the case by the sounds of things um do you think there's going to be more channels coming out i mean we've just got you know twitter's being rebranded to x if they eventually allowed to change the sign which i read in the news yesterday <laughs> um but the um yeah twitter's going to x there's threads coming out which i have joined but most of i found it from one of my guests a couple of weeks ago it doesn't exist in europe so europe the eu have said no to threads because mm. of data privacy issues um on the meta platform um you know we've still got wechat in yep. China, which has not made its way really out of China. Um, do you think there's going to just be this constant evolution and actually what brands should be doing is keeping an eye on what are the new channels? What can I do with them and actually start to invest money on paid, you know, paid ads within those channels early on? Yeah, I guess, I guess the kind of point to that is there might not be new channels or there could be new channels, but there's also going to be new products. Mm -hmm. So when a new product is like launched yeah. by Meta, for example, you know, Reels, there's a huge emphasis there on making sure it's commercially viable for them as a platform. Um, yeah. and, and so therefore, the, you know, the advertising and also the organic content are much more favoured. And you know, Reels has been a, probably two, I think it's probably two years now since it's been launched. There's yeah. there's good there's good traction with it. You know, I personally don't think Threads will live as long as we think it is. I think it might. <laughs> yeah, it'll end up coming onto the Instagram platform like the same way Reels did. Reels started out as own app, mm. then they put it back into the Instagram platform. So that's probably yeah. where Threads ends up again. It, I don't think you know when we look at, um, at our you know, attention. That's what the mm. currency is. You know, we, TikTok has come in. Um, I remember actually we, we, we did the UK marketing for TikTok um, back in 2018. So we were one of the first, the mm. first people to be it. And I saw that coming down, down, the trip, down the line. I was like, oh my goodness, this platform is going to just consume everyone. You know, mm. when you break it down back in 2018, it was full screen optimization, vertical video. It was everything which we were pitching to clients that they should be doing from a story perspective. Um, mm. And it should be something which, which is obviously, and as it has, railroaded all other businesses and you look at you know we're 10 minutes in now we've not mentioned snapchat you know that's that that, <laughs> yeah. that, that as a platplatform came out of nowhere it's it's trying to figure out its its place in the, in the world so there's always gonna mm. there's always going to be opportunities and I, I have heard of businesses having huge success on snapchat because there's there's a high attention still from people using it from a messaging app, mm. app at a certain demographic um, but low advertising spend so I guess my, what I say to founders um, is look you know you, you don't if you want to build, prove the model works, you know, let's take the basic mm. unique economics of a, of a Shopify stop, shop, okay? The majority of these businesses are physical products, aren't they? You know, it's e-commerce, it's yeah, FMCG. Yeah. That business should be profitable at unit level. So you should be able to buy something, for, develop and manufacture something for X, sell it for Y, and there's a profit there. Okay, that, what I would say is that the emphasis on the first, you know, zero to, zero to 100K should, should be on that ROI being positive and that cash flow being positive. Because yep. otherwise, when you get to 100K, if you're trying to look into things like pipe and tide and getting access to funding to scale a marketing, if you if you if you if you're unprofitable at a unit basis, that's not going to happen. So I would yeah. say that the first 100K of sales has to come from a profitable 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 viewpoint. You have to prove people want the product. Uh, when you start getting you know creeping towards that 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 proof point and you're at scale and you're looking at that kind of one 
one million mark of a uh, fundamental profitable channel, but, you know, what I would say is test a couple, see what works, get to that million, scale it. Um, you can then start taking a little bit more risks. You can start testing, taking your foot, in, foot into areas that maybe you didn't A, have the expertise or talent for yourself. So you actually need to hire someone or an agency. So outsourcing that to somebody else um, to be able to then scale that further. So where, where, where I think people should be spending their time is firstly is, what, is what's profitable. You know, if, if you're scaling the business, you need to know that this is profitable. You need to be able to pay yourself at the end of the mm -hmm. day. You then need to be able to go and walk into investors and say, actually, I've got a, I've got a positive um, unit economics model here. I need capital to be able to scale it. I need more stock. I need to be able to put more into marketing. This is how it works. So, um, and I don't, I don't, I don't think if I was to wake up every single day and turn my attention to social, although the, the areas of that which is completely free, um, factor in the time you're spending on it. Do I think that gives a positive ROI and a sustainable business model to make that appealing for investors? I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's interesting as well, you mentioned about the first 100K, and that is, as you say, it's almost like the proof of concept, isn't it? You've got to get the MVP out and go, do you know what, people are going to buy this. We, there are channels we can spend money on this and actually get a good return from it. Um, do you think then, when it, when it comes to like choosing the right channels to spend that first hundred, or to make that first 100K to get that turnover, do you think people need to stick to something like Google and just go, they're already searching for it, the intent's there, get some revenue in. Do you think it's more beneficial to prove it on a harder channel like social? Does it depend? It, it, it depends. And again, you look at a cost perspective from, from Google, you know, you can be spending 5K, you can have a positive ROI and it ticks along. You know, is that something that should just be done anyway? You know? Yeah. If the people are searching for it, should we be there and know that's going to be positive? I think that's not going to move the needle, but it's just going to keep the lights on. So mm. then that gives you the ability to say, okay, people like the product. Um, I've seen a lot of interesting areas of um, content creation where people are utilizing not content creators, but people who create content. There's a difference between that yeah, yeah. Um, and seeding that or kind of organic UGC aspects and turning that into ads, which works. Uh, I, mm. see, I see a lot of people utilizing gifting well still. You know, what we've seen from the influencer marketing yeah. space is a little bit of a backlash of it. So influencers are, you know, I think it's a bit of a negative, uh, I think there's a negative sentiment towards them. So you are seeing people not wanting to pay influencers, but there's still this kind of micro followers of, you know, 10K, 20K, who if you give a good product to and you ask a really yeah. nice personal message for them to review it, you'll still get that because people want to create content. You know, yeah. I think we've seen it with Barbie is that every single girl has gone to Barbie in a pink dress. So this has kind of become a cultural norm where people have gone like, okay, I want to look like, I want to look the part. Yeah, yeah. So if you've got a relevant yeah. product and you want to make it cool and you find the right people, people still like getting gifts. You know, I get gifted a lot, mm. of, a lot of things and I'll, I'll talk about them. Um, so, you know, it comes back to, I guess the question comes back to is what are you selling? And, and if, you're just trying to come, yeah, yeah. if you're just trying to sell something to sell it for the sake of set, make a bit of money or actually if you're trying to innovate and create something new, mm. those two things are very different. You know, I think when you look at the Shopify model, maybe five, again, five years ago, people were just buying things from China, sticking a label on it and selling it. That, that again that doesn't work did that myself yeah again again does that does that work now um no absolutely not you know we've, absolutely we've not. got we've yeah. got amazon where all these things can be searched you know you can go and find something if you want to so the idea that everything everything that's going to have a, everything's going to have a brand associated with it and you can just sell a candle or a premium product through your own website it doesn't work anymore so it's going back more on the emphasis of the product so i think what we're actually seeing is more emphasis on product development and product innovation which therefore then makes that more appealing for marketers because then actually then you're not getting a bidding fight. You know, you're not trying to compete to zero on pricing, um, which then becomes more appealing because you're actually then having to innovate. So I would say like, we're having a little bit of a, you know, the world's calling a little bit, you know, we're having a little bit of the death of, death of that dropshipping model of buying things from China. Yep. We're starting to see companies have a much more, who want to be serious and be taking serious in this space, a much more emphasis on supply chain, much more emphasis on you know, manufacturing it themselves, where their product's been sourced for sustainability issues or cost issues, you mm -hmm. know, those two things have been factored into it, um, which is leading to people actually caring about the product more. And then when the, what you get in there is better better products. So when you've got a better product, it's easier to market. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you've gone down this road because it's something we talk about a lot on the podcast. And every time we talk about it, I learn something new and we hear a different view on it. And that thing is brand value. And like, what does the brand actually stand for? And I think you're absolutely right. You know, we're talking about social today and in social media, you cannot hide, can you? You know, if you've got something bad within your brand remit, like you're not sourcing your products ethically or you're charging too much for, for, for them or your markup's too high, etc. It's only a matter of time until somebody actually posts that and everybody stops buying from you because that post will be visible and it yeah. might get shared by thousands of people and you could fall apart. 
So you, there's nowhere to hide anymore, is there? You need to make sure, as you say, you love all the things you just listed, supply chain through to how do our team operate to how do we make our products to yeah. what does our shipping look like? Is it carbon neutral? <laughs> and stuff like um, that. Um, what, one interesting thing the role of social has played in that is I think it's democratized mm. ideas a little bit. You know, we all, yeah. we've all seen coaches on Instagram saying how to create your, your website and sell, you know. So I think we've all been bombarded with those. So I think the idea of like consumer, consumerism of knowing that the t-shirt you bought from Ralph Lauren is just made in a factory in Turkey and then put a label on it um, mm. is the same as, you know, knowing, knowing, knowing that the, the everything's you're buying are done, you know, there's a, there's a purchase price and a retail price. So I think that, you know, that idea of internet consumerism has, is much more, we're much more aware of it now. And I think that leads mm. to other people questioning. I think it leads to people shopping around more. You know, we, we, we know that, you know, uh, there's been many things going on on social media that these products are the same, they're, mm. made in different, they're made in the same factory, they've got different logos on. You know, I yeah. think I think Aldi have done that very, very well with um, their supply chain and, you know, their products. And, you know, they don't all say it, but there's a very much awareness that these products are the same and made in the same places that brand the brands are made. And all it is mm. is just a different logo on it. So um, that's, I think that's led to um, consumers being more skeptical, but it's also led to entrepreneurs having to actually build value. Um, mm. I, you know, when I look at the value of, you know, I've, I have met some people who just, who are, you know, who have built very, very, very possible D2C websites, but they're just mm. buying like, like markup selling. You know, yeah. they know- It comes that. like a marketplace, doesn't it? It's just, uh, it's like Amazon. It's just, you're looking for it, here it is, buy it, done. Yeah, yeah but you don't, you're not building a brand, you're not bring, building a business, you're not building a story. Mm. So I think that's the, that's the that's the the piece now we're into is where, you know, how do you take a, a how do you create something which is ultimately acquirable by someone, by a big company? Mm. And you know, when you look at big companies, they they struggle to innovate in a product perspective. Yep. They struggle to innovate in a marketing perspective, and they are very big and they are looking for acquisitions. And there is opportunity to take their um, their market share. You mm. know, we've got a business which is in the in the pet space. Obviously, the pet space has been booming. But the, there has been a huge rise in natural supplements for pets, and people yeah. people want want their dogs and their cats to be eating natural food, like the same as humans. So you've got the big players like Mars who have got shelf space mm. in Tesco's. Can can their supply chain handle in the development of a of a, of a natural product? You know, when we were working at Social Chain, we worked on a a, a launch for a big FMCG business. I'm not going to mention it, but it was mm. a it was a nat, it was a it was a new product development, basically, within, within, their, within their group. It took them two and a half years to get it to market. You know, two and a half wow. years to get it to market, and that's going through layers of sign-off. And actually, the interesting part is that that business would have done much better if it was, if it was released a year earlier, maybe even two years earlier, yeah. because the, the, the market had already shifted. Yeah. So what young businesses have got is they're much quicker. They can get things to market quicker. They're not strung mm. down by regulation, process, and sign-off. So, you know, I'm not painting a massive doom and gloom picture here, but I think there's a huge, there's yeah. a huge opportunity to still disrupt big companies because big companies cannot move quickly. Mm. I think it's a really, really valid point, actually. And you reminded me of the example of, um, I think there's a McDonald's documentary I watched ages ago where they wanted to add a blueberry item to their dessert menu in America, but they couldn't because they had to literally get government approval to grow that many blueberries to yeah. actually grow the thing. So if you're a small independent that's next to McDonald's, um, you could say, well, we've got the blueberry ice cream and they don't, which was the you know really kind of crude example of that. I guess a really big question then is, let's say the brand has got the most amazing brand message and, and you must you must be the same as me in this. You've heard it all before where someone goes, look, we, we're way more ethical than them. Our parts uh, and products are better than theirs are, but they seem to get all the SEO traffic. They're always spoken about on social. So the question really is, how do you get that content right? What, what are some of the things you need to, you know, some of the actual executions of content to bring across that brand message to go we are ethical we're doing things well and there's a real story you can buy into behind this yeah i think um brand, brand comes from time you know the reason mm. we can name all these big brands is because they've been around for a long period of time you know if you look yeah. if you looked at um jim shark's original logo it's not the same as it is now you know it was uh yeah you know you probably say that's a terrible brand to, to be honest you know um ben's, mm. ben's in a fantastic job with the business and now it's a perfect brand um but yeah. when you get started things are never perfect things are never right you need to put them out there you need to learn so, um, you know, I think what we've got now is founders trying to create something maybe before they're ready. You know, if mm. you go out there and try and get a completely perfect brand, if you try and get a, a perfect product um, and launch that, you're not going to get feedback. 
So I think there's a huge value in just starting, learning, selling, getting that feedback because, you know, customers are always going to evolve and adapt. And what you need to mm. do is you need to um, navigate the waters with something that you might not be happy with, but not be perfect, but it's going to evolve and going to change. And that mentality yeah. of changing with the times and developing uh, is, again, is what sets entrepreneurs different to big corporates. So um, I'd say from that perspective is you look at people who are further ahead. Of course, there's always going to be people further ahead. There's going to be people further behind. You just have mm. to have that mentality that changes constantly and that you're going to evolve with time. Yeah, yeah, nice. I, I really like that. I was not expecting your response to start with the word time, but I think it's, it's, it's really relevant. You're absolutely right. We know those brands because of the time that we've been, um, we've been eating their products or wearing their clothes or whatever it might be. I guess the, the next thing is in terms of that evolution then, so you start off with brand message number one. We know it's going to be rubbish, but that's fine. We're not going to put too much time into it yet. We're going to evolve in, enough time to get people buying, get over that first 100K but it's now starting to evolve. What do you need to do to learn? Like, what are the stats you're looking at? What are, is it customer surveys? Do you need to yeah. talk to people? What's the way to go around that? Yeah, I think firstly, your customers, you know, that's the most important thing. Why have you bought this? Why, you know, mm -hmm. and that's everything from, you know, a single DTC transaction to any wholesale relationship. You know, those, yep. those are as important. Um, I'd, I'd ask, I'd, I'd speak to wholesalers about, you know, what are you looking for? You know, we've got, we've had a huge rise in, um, I guess you'd call it kind of the protein bar space over the last kind of five mm -hmm. years, you know, Whole Foods and these kind of mm -hmm. retailers are stocking them left, right and centre. Um, and there's a lot of businesses coming into that sector. What are you looking for in the future? What, you know, what are your um, business, you know, your Sainsbury's, Tesco's, the, what, are the, what are your objectives? Obviously, ESG is a huge part of it now. Um, back in local is a huge part of it now. So, you know, mm -hmm. again, if you're buying a product from one place from China or whatever, and then you're putting a logo on it, you're selling it, that's not hitting their criteria. So one, one of our businesses um, has got an opportunity with one of the big retailers because it manufactures in the UK. And that was a big, that's a big brand message for them. So they mm. want to work with someone who actually has um, an integrated, integrated manufacturing supply chain, which we've got. So these kind of understanding of the macro aspect of what the market is buying, what the retailers are buying, what consumers are buying, with also where you think you can take the product, get the product to, uh, bring those two together and you know that feedback's essential. Um, and, yeah. I, and I think that's, you know, there's a, there's a reason when, we, again, and I come back to them, I think they are the big example is, Shopify, is um, for Shopify is Gymshark. You know, they, mm. their products, their products continu continuously evolve. Um, yes, yeah. it's, yes, it's in the fashion space, but, you know, they're all, always taking feedback in from people, always developing new ideas. Um, and I think that's one of the beautiful things about fashion is that it creates that mentality because you've got a huge range of SKUs, you've got a huge range of products. If you come out with one skew and you're trying to constantly market it over and over again and not taking that feedback on, you're not going to develop. So I would say, yeah, the feedback from as many places as possible. Um, but also you've got, you have to combine that with the entrepreneurial gut. You know, there's a reason why you've got to this point already. And if you yeah. think you know something that the market doesn't know and you think you see an opportunity, go after it. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. And I love that idea about it evolving um, and bringing it on the journey. Um, that also then bringing it back to social a little bit more directly is that that then creates content doesn't it so you mentioned gym sharks clothing range they now have something to be shouting at you know it's a new we've got a drop coming um you know we we interviewed um the guy who runs how to beast a few months ago and he was saying that whenever he's got a new drop he does a video about it and he calls it a drop it's not like spring summer range which is like a really old school way of looking at um products but he says i've got a new drop coming and people can start pre-ordering things or they can start viewing the range before it's even available build a bit of excitement or sometimes there's just as a big 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 shout out saying there's another drop but bringing it back to kind of the content you then post on social this isn't going to be everything obviously but it, it starts to give you something you can actually use can't you yeah and look you know i think it's very easy now to plan an annual content calendar of the trends that are going to happen Mm. You know, for example, yeah. we know pumpkin spice latte is going to be talk talked about in October. Yep. That's just going to happen. So if you're in a space where you can, where, you know, again, coming back to the value of having a, a good supply chain and good manufacturing relationships, if you can get, if you can hit the supply chain for a pumpkin spice feed featured product, and you can do it at the right costs and you can get it out there in a small sample, go and do it. You know, Joe Malone, I think, are again a big business, but they're really hitting these seasonal trends really well. They're developing ca capsule, you know, ca capsule collections. Yeah. limited runs putting them to market having a new story to tell while also having the legacy range which is still very popular mm. so i think yeah. that what social has meant is that businesses have to be more dynamic now they have to be having new stories every single day you know we've gone from a marketing world where you know you put a coca-cola billboard up above the bypass and people will see it and you'll be drinking coca-cola and then at christmas mm. they'll put santa claus on it 
to now now actually every single day something's happening and the ability to give your yeah. tone or brand across or something different every single day. So that means two things. Now brands have to have a tone of voice and a way of handling situations. You know, we've got mm-hmm. um, Twitter where yeah. where you can get yourself into any conversation. You can react to the X logo, which we saw with Greg's yesterday and Greg's did this reactive piece really, really well. Um, yep. But also, you know, to say culturally ahead of things, you need to make sure that you are adapting with the times. So are you launching a vegan range when vegan veganuary is around? You know, what's the story to tell there? And all these other pieces where um, it actually means that there's more news to talk about and therefore that's the more content to create and therefore social is just an extension of your comms channel. Yeah, yeah, nice. Love it. I think it's really, really powerful, actually. Um, and I guess one big question I've got then, you mentioned like tone of voice and actually communicating with customers and dealing with some of these things. Um, how do you manage all of that as things start to grow? Because I imagine some people are looking at their social going, it's getting busier, people are communicating more and more with us. <laughs> what sort of tools and stuff are you thinking about using or would you use a tool? Do you think people need to sit there and manually respond from the brand to every comment? Um, how do you actually manage that flow of communication? Look, there's two ways to go around it, okay? There's, there's to go super corporate and like, let's create a, a framework and a guidance or there's the paddy power approach. Give it to a, seven, give it to a 17 or an intern and let them do what they want with it. And I think this comes, nice. and this comes with a little bit of a mentality piece. It's like, you know, once you once you understand the tone of who you're trying to be, obviously mm. Paddy Power are probably the extreme when it comes to freedom. Um, yeah. But there's definitely there's definitely an ability to say actually we don't want to be completely rugged, but we actually want to have some framework. So firstly, what I would create is a very very short cycle, uh, sign off cycle. You know, if you're posting something three days later, you're irrelevant. So yep. you know, I when I say short, short sign off, I say an hour. Something yeah. happens, you have to sign off in an hour. So a really short sign off process. Autonomy for a team, again, this is probably more a big corporate piece, but if you're a founder and doing it, you can just do what you want. Yep. Autonomy for the team to do what they want, you know, remove the remove the framework, you know. Um, social yeah. is a forgiving place. If you post something, you'll be forgotten about two days later. Obviously, we've got to factor in the fact there's there's probably my, now more social cultural issues in terms of uh, what we've seen with, with Bud, Bud, Budweiser uh, and Nike. Mm. So, you know, making sure yep. that maybe you don't, you don't enter conversations where you're not right. Um, but have a kind of framework where you, you play in this space, you have freedom to do what you want. And as a man, as an owner of the company, I'm not going to come at you. You know, you are free yeah. to do what you want. And then alongside that, including standardized product shots, images and that kind of stuff. But especially with to- tone, you know, if you're small, you've got nothing to lose. You might as well try and be a little bit punchy. And I think tabs do that quite well. Um, they're a really good example of someone who's kind of just free, yeah. to, free to do that one. So I guess when you're small, you've got nothing to lose. So you might as well try and be a bit different and a bit, bit, bit disruptive. Yeah, and I think that is one of the challenges. Like we've we've certainly, we don't do social ourselves, but we've seen other clients do it. And it's like, right, show us the content calendar for the next month. We'll approve all of it. And you can just see the social person going, this isn't social anymore. This is just us shouting into the abyss. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. every yeah. now and then. Yeah. It, needs to be, it needs to be on point, doesn't it, yeah. with what's going on? And I think, look, there's, 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 there's things you can plan. You know, you've, you've got, like I say, the pumpkin spice latte, which is going to come back around. So that's going to be there. So you can plan 20%, but the rest of the 80% of it is just going to be get 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 a social media manager, get a really, you know, the ideal situation is a social media expert who's also a creative. You know, those yep. things are very rare to find. So they can think of it, they can make it, and they can post it. But yeah, they're, they are quite rare to find. You know, I remember the kind of famous post on LinkedIn where it's like, okay, you're a social media manager. These are all the 10, 25 things you do. You know, mm. there's no re- there's a reason people have huge teams, yeah, yeah. huge teams, but... If you can find someone who, you know, or as a founder master and that's the ability of creating content and posting it, there is yeah. there is opportunity there. So um yeah, I think you know, eighty percent reactive, twenty percent planned. If you go with that mindset, you'll you'll see yourself creating content. Nice. And I'm glad you've said that because I imagine a lot of brands are probably looking at it the opposite way and going, oh, yeah. let's plan it all and know what we're doing yeah. and get all these lovely shoots done and yeah. but actually making it a bit raw and uncut is is what you want on social. You want to connect to the brand and you can't do that if it's always super polished. Exactly. You know, you know you know you've got new products coming out, so plan that, plan that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But you know, death by committee and death by planning is why big big businesses are so slow. Yeah. I think even with a product launch, though, you, you, you can't plan for the comments and the reaction you're going to get. And if the reaction is negative, you've got some work to do and you need to do it really, really thick and fast. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself just in a problem where everyone's moaning about what's going on. Um, I, guess, I guess the last point to come down to then is like if someone was building a team to look after social. So, again, thinking about a lot of our listeners are probably not quite at the stage where they've got a full time person. Or they might have just got their full time person. You mentioned someone to actually manage the channels with the autonomy, the freedom to just respond to staff, own staff. Yeah. 
creative person, I guess, if they're not creative themselves, sitting next to them who just works for them, just going, I need this, I need this, I need this, and they're just building creatives to push out. Yeah. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Who else do you want around that social team? What authority do they need? And is there any other any other things people should be looking at with their marketing teams to go, right, we're also going to need someone to do this, to do this, to do this? Yeah, I think, I think, my, I think my opinion is that an agency is not right for that. You know, you need someone, mm. an ag- you know, an agency is buying specialisms you can't find yourself. Um, yep. When we've got the rise of influencers and creators, their expertise exists abundantly in the world. Yep. So I would have that person as close to the product and the founder as possible because brand is something which is so, so important. Mm-hmm. So those people have to be in the business, not out of the business. And they have to have autonomy, they have to have the skills and they have to have, tr- yep. they have, to have trust. You know, the, the founder, uh, founders, Founders tend to be product people. You know that tends mm-hmm. to be. You know, we, me and you are both founders, but our founder, our product is marketing, so we are product people. Yeah, yeah. So they know the product very, very well. Um, that's why they've got into it. They don't know the other disciplines very well. So having trust of someone who tells you what to do is really, really important. And you can't be coming in saying, actually, you know, put more, put, put the product wider in this image. That's actually no, actually, when we see a video, oh, we haven't mentioned that there's a sale on, or we haven't mentioned mm-hmm. that the product's now available, or we haven't, we're not telling them what size it is. Like they are trying to sell, sell, sell. So having someone who says, no, this is the way social works and the payoff's not today. It's not today. Yeah, I'm not, yeah. I'm not yeah. going to post this video on sales. I'm not going to go viral. And that's what people thought social mm-hmm. was. And, and there was a time when it might have been. But you have to yeah. realize that this is something that's just going to build over time. And when we look at our data in a year's time, we see that our, our, our organic traffic traffic's increased by 20%. When we've seen that our following's increased, when we've seen that our EBITDA's mm-hmm. increased because we've got this, that's when you can start saying, yes, this makes more sense. But there's the, the immediacy of social media being being the big impact that's going to move the needle doesn't exist. Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. And certainly from my point of view, I mean, we, we work so heavily on Google. It's the main focus for us. When people start spending money on Facebook, even doing like brand awareness ads or they start pushing videos out and getting views, as you say, it's top of funnel. It's not going to change revenue overnight. We see Google start to lift. And one of the things we see happen a lot on Google is brand search. So if brands are starting to advertise themselves a lot on social across lots of different channels, especially the more um, omni-channel it is, the more we see that brand search goes from like 100 searches a day to 10,000. Yeah. And then you, it's like, we don't even need to run ads on those in Google. We do sometimes, but we don't need to. Your but, organic but, listings but, are already but, there. People can come find you. Well, that's, uh, that's it. But the, the interesting thing about attribution, and we can go into this in so much more detail, because the majority mm. of businesses are run on Google Analytics, that sales yeah. are attributed to Google. Yeah. And the problem I've yeah. got with some attribution is that People are so religious over over Google. They go, well, yeah, yeah. this last click says it was from Google, so there's a Google sale. Yeah, yeah. And then they go, we have this conversation all the time, it's, all the time. It's ridiculous. Um, I think yeah, yeah. I think someone who can build a really powerful attribution model, there's a, there's a lot of value in that. That would be a really big project to go after. Yeah, yeah. There's a few systems now, especially with GA four being as rubbish as it is, uh, which I'll openly say. Um, you know, this this platforms at the moment like Triple Whale seems to be one of the biggest ones yeah. that. Um, that people are using and it's much better actually looking at all the different platforms i guess google will take credit for google doing google's thing and give nothing towards facebook and social yeah, and that's but, just the way its attribution works but i i've, adv- I've, I've advised a, a FTSE 100 company which is mm. a, which is a retailer and yeah. it's run off google really <laughs> interesting google's gospel the, and this is the piece about, yeah, yeah this is the piece about being big to, to mm. change that is no, you can't change that. That yeah, yeah. that will not change. The, to introduce a new system of reporting revenue and marketing spend will break that business. Yeah, because yeah. it's so yeah, big. Yeah, absolutely. So like, this is what I mean. If you can get a, a really powerful tech stack, you can get a really powerful understanding of what's going on from a customer perspective, mm. you can scale a business because the big boys, they are not where you think they are. You think, you look at yeah, big yeah. companies, you think, oh my God, they figured everything out. Actually, yeah, yeah. they're so slow and slow broken that, being smarter, being being agile, being more dynamic, innovating in product perspective, innovating in marketing, testing, learning quicker is enough is enough to, to win. Yeah, yeah. And I, I completely agree with that. We we have a number of corporate clients in our agency and we also have a lot of small, nimble Shopify stores. And the corporates especially, when you ask them something like, Okay, we want to change this and we need to change it now you get you wait a week and then you get a sort of we've had a discussion a couple of meetings about this we just want to understand what the value of this is and we're like well zero now you've missed it it's already it's already gone we've already lost um but i guess yeah very last question to ask then last place to uh, to land is if you were a small business a one-man band right now um running on shopify 
and you want to do more with social, what is the number one or the top two or, two or three things you would be doing right now on social just to cut through the noise? And let's assume you were selling, you've started a t-shirt shop, um, you've got unique t-shirts, it's all ethical, etc. cetera. Um, you've ticked lots of the boxes, you've got a good brand. How do you get that out there on social immediately? Yeah, I think the, the, big, the big piece is to play where, play where's new, mm -hmm. consistency. You know, this is, like I say, the impact is not now, it's a year's time. Turn up every single day, um, testing different co content formats, um, and not, not getting this happen when it fails. You know, my my story of social change started out by me running big Twitter accounts. You know, back in 2013, yeah. it took me 400 tweets to get to 400 followers, and then it took me 500 tweets to get to 10,000 followers. So I could have given up after tweet three, 399, and I think a lot of businesses would have done. But uh, for some reason, I was a 19-year-old guy and a little bit deluded. And I managed to <laughs> manage to do it. So that consistency of you know keeping trying, keeping going, learning, testing uh, different types of content, playing yeah. where playing where's new and consistency. That might be consistency. That's consistency over two, three years. You know, not expecting immediate results, taking pressure off, giving trust to the team is where you get mm. results. And I thought, nice. Unfortunately, nice. unfortunately, the important thing you got to caveat there is you know time is money and that does cost. So you've got to be in a situation to really give that freedom to be able to do yeah. that. Which comes from having yeah. a good omnichannel business, profitable across other channels. Absolutely. And also then when you are posting and people do start to pick up those posts, have everything else lined up from supply chain to good website, good user journey, clear value offering, etc. Exactly. So, exactly. It's now, nice. I think when social media came about, everyone, it, was a, it was a golden bullet. And now it's mm. just part of a strategy. It's part of, nice. a, it's part of an omnichannel business strategy where, yeah. you, where you know, if social, if we wouldn't. We would never sit here and say email is a golden bullet to get to ten million revenue from one channel, mm. and we would never yeah. send an email out expecting to get sales straight away. Social's there now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, amazing. Well, Dom, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us today. No it's been worries. great. Thank you so much. Lovely. And for everybody else listening, we post every Friday. Next week, we're starting a new series all about email as well. So make sure you check it out. I've already recorded a couple of the episodes, and I can say we've got some amazing guests coming in. So thanks for tuning in. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't. See you again next week.